Would you like to know the 2020 ACLS updates? Then you came to the right place. Hello, my name is Bridget. I'm a nurse practitioner. And today I'll be going over all of the 2020 ACLS updates. Without further ado, let's get started. I want to just say that this is always for educational purposes and not medical advice. ACLS guidelines are reviewed and updated every five years. So this is the most current guidelines that were reviewed in 2020 and then the next review will process and changes would be 2025. Question of the day is, would you like to see me speaking here in the corner like a picture in picture or B, you prefer just the screen being recorded or C, either one is fine. I'm just trying to see what people prefer. So drop a comment below, let me know what your preference is. The first guideline change that we have for ACLS is that in 2015, it was one breath every five to six seconds for respiratory arrest with a bag mask device and one breath every six seconds for ventilation with an advanced airway in place. And now the new 2020 is that one breath every six seconds for respiratory arrest with or without an advanced airway in place and also for cardiac arrest with an advanced airway. The next update is for bradycardia. In 2015, the atropine dose was 0.5 milligrams and dopamine was 2 to 20 micrograms per kilogram per minute. And now it has now been updated. Atropine is one milligram, but maintains the same frequency of dosing as every three to five minutes with a max dose of three milligrams. And dopamine is five to 20 micrograms per kilogram per minute. In the past, tachycardia, the joules were specified. So for example, if it was narrow QRS complex with a regular rhythm, it was 50 to 100 joules. I won't go through all of them, but for 2020, what they are saying is follow your specific device's recommended energy level to maximize the success of the first shock. For post-cardiac arrest care, 2015 guidelines said to titrate oxygen to 94% or higher. 2020 guidelines are saying titrate oxygen saturation to 92% to 98%. There are now six links for both in-hospital cardiac arrest and out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And you can pause here and review these. This is the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest chain of survival. And this is the in-hospital cardiac arrest chain of survival. IV versus IO. So in 2015, they were saying that IV access and IO access are equivalent. And IV is intravenous and IO is intraosseous, so in the bone. But 2020 guidelines say that IV is preferred over IO access. Unless IV fails, then it's okay to proceed to IO. And the reason for this is that because there were some small observational studies that showed worse outcomes with IO delivery. So it is important to try to get an IV if possible, but you can still use an IO if necessary. Central venous catheters are still not recommended during a code unless no other access can be obtained. For cardiac arrest, you want to do epinephrine one milligram every three to five minutes or every four minutes as mid-range. Amiodarone and lidocaine are equivalent. They have added a maternal cardiac arrest for in-hospital. In pregnant patients who develop cardiac arrest, the focus should be on high quality CPR and relief of the aortocaval compression through left lateral uterine displacement while the patient is supine. What does this mean? This means that someone on the team stands on the left side of the patient and cups the uterus, pulling it up and leftward. Alternatively, if there's if you're standing on the right of the patient, you push the uterus left and upward off of the maternal vessels. They've also added a, a ventricular assist device informational algorithm. Another recommendation is, is using waveform capnography with a bag mass device in order to assess the efficacy of the breaths. For intubated patients, the AHA recommends uses quantitative waveform capnography to monitor CPR quality. High quality chest compressions are achieved when the end tidal CO2 value is at least 10 to 20 millimeters of mercury. There's also a revised stroke algorithm, new stroke triage algorithm for EMS destination, focus on large vessel occlusion for all healthcare providers. In regards to endovascular therapy, the treatment involves placing a catheter into the brain and removing the clot that's causing the stroke. The window is now up to 24 hours from onset of symptoms for endovascular therapy. This is not TPA. Both TPA and endovascular therapy can be given or performed if time criteria and inclusion criteria are met. 
consider having EMS bypass the emergency department and go straight to, to imaging, so CT or MRI. The initial assessment can be performed there to save time. And they are now saying, and they are now saying for stroke to titrate the oxygen to greater than 94%. Please hit the like button, subscribe, turn on the notification bell. Appreciate you all.